We are delighted to have Dr. Meera Sulmaniam today. She is pediatric lung specialist at the Children's Hospital in Boston. She is also assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. We are going to talk to her about asthma today. Dr. Meera Subramaniam, thank you very much for coming to our studio. Thank you for inviting me, Upendra. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm delighted to come. So, before we get into the nitty gritty of uh, asthma, uh, tell us what asthma is and what are some of its systems, symptoms. So, asthma actually comes from the word Greek word panting. Mm -hmm. So, it's connected with respiratory diseases, as you can tell. Mm. It's Symptoms are having a cough, having wheezing, which is a high-pitched whistling sound. It's also shortness of breath, hence mm -hmm. the word panting. And sometimes people also complain that they have tightness of mm -hmm. the chest. Mm -hmm. So when people have these symptoms, we advise them to go to their doctors to get assessed. And asthma actually is a chronic inflammatory disease. Mm -hmm where there is inflammation in your airways. And because of the inflammation, your airways become narrow. Mm -hmm. And because of the inflammation, they also become what we call hyper-responsive, so that they become narrow and they also contract and they become even more narrow. Um, there's mucus secretion because of the inflammation and that uh, makes breathing even more difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my question is, like, the symptoms which you named about four, four syst uh, symptoms or so, uh, those symptoms, anybody can experience that. How do you really know that this is related with uh, asthma? Absolutely right, that these symptoms can be associated with many respiratory diseases. Sure. What we say is that if you are having cough beyond three weeks, if you are waking up at night with cough, because asthma is more common at night or early morning, mm. if you feel like these symptoms are associated seasonally, mm. like they're more in spring, in fall, or in winter, or all three of these, um, or if you associate it with some specific thing like being exposed to dust, being exposed to pets, um, or in the presence of irritants, and they are not getting better, then it's definitely time to see What about your allergy? Like, how do, is it different from allergy, having allergy? So allergy is a huge component of asthma mm -hmm. in the sense that people who have allergies have a much higher rate of actually getting asthma. Okay. Because allergens which cause allergy, like what you have rhinitis, you know, people have like running noses or sneezing. Mm. Um, also, these allergens that cause you these allergy symptoms can be also triggers for airway inflammation, just mm -hmm. like they are triggers for your nasal inflammation. Mm -hmm. And that is why they are a huge cause of asthma. A majority of the asthma actually is allergic in nature, but then there is asthma that is also non-allergic. So now, uh, in, in the United States, you have about 25 million Americans suffering from asthma. And then out of 25 million, 7 million are children, which is a very high uh, proportion. And you are a specialist in um, uh, this area. So what are some of the symptoms we should really look into the children for this? So it's, again, you know, Asthma can present in very young children, mm -hmm. even who are less than a year old. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to sort of classify it up to five years and beyond five years. So what is the most uh, prone age for children? So most prone age seems to be before five years of before age. Before five. Mm -hmm. That early? That early. Okay. And it's very hard to diagnose asthma in that age group mm -hmm. because they are so young, um, it may be, you know, overlapping with some other diseases. Mm -hmm. We can't do lung function tests in kids of that age. Mm -hmm. So it's in that age very much a clinical judgment, mm -hmm. which, like I mentioned, is based on your symptoms. Mm -hmm. So when you ask people, you ask all of these questions that I mentioned, what their symptoms are, mm -hmm. what precipitates their symptoms, 
is it some specific allergen? Is it cold air? Is mm. it exercise? Is it some irritant? Is it like tobacco smoke? We also ask them whether um, they have tried any medications. If they have tried any asthma medications, have they responded to that? Mm. And then very importantly, we also ask them what allergies they have, to your point, mm. that you know that is a very, very important reason for asthma. Mm. We ask them about their family history because there's a big correlation mm -hmm. of family history with asthma. If mm. your mom has asthma, you're much more likely to have asthma. Mm. Mm. If both your parents have asthma, you're even more likely mm -hmm. to have asthma. Mm. And we also then try to rule out by our history um, other conditions which may mimic asthma. Mm -hmm. And then if we need to, we'll do an x-ray, which is basically mostly to rule out other conditions. Now, um, also somewhere I was reading is that uh, there is a chance of uh, over-medication in children uh, about asthma. And uh, some studies also say that uh, after a certain age, the asthma goes away by itself among children. What is your take on that? So coming to overuse of medication, I would say more than overuse, um, it is, I think, not using it properly. Mm. I think sometimes we come across patients who are non-compliant with the necessary medications. Mm -hmm. There will be patients who need some kind of maintenance medication to keep this inflammation mm -hmm. down so that they don't keep getting these acute episodes where they are very sick. Mm -hmm. So some people will not use their maintenance medications which keeps the inflammation down and then suddenly they'll have a lot of symptoms and then they'll start using medications which are rescue medications mm -hmm. which if taken frequently as not prescribed mm -hmm. can definitely have adverse events, mm -hmm. including, you know, sometimes death, you know. So how do you define, like, you know, the in, in pediatrics, in your language, uh, uh, what age group up to you go in, in, in children, like 17, 18? So we see patients up to 21 years of age. 21 years of And age. then after that, it's, you know, taken over by adults. But from 18 onwards, 18 to 21 is a transitional period. Mm -hmm. People can be seen by adult Sure. Uh, doctors after they are 18. Okay. Now, how common this asthma is among the Indian and South Asian population? That's an interesting question. If you look at like the prevalence in the United States, mm -hmm. um, it's about roughly about 8%. Mm -hmm. In India, um, because there's so much variability mm -hmm. from area to area, level of pollution, mm -hmm. and I think we are not able to get very accurate data mm -hmm. from many different regions. Mm -hmm. It's somewhat hard to come up with a prevalence, mm -hmm. but if you look at like various studies and if you look at um, WHO numbers, mm -hmm. it falls anywhere between 10 to 15 percent. Yeah, and some studies even report a little bit lower in some areas. So, so Mira, um, as the children age, and does is there any possibility that asthma goes away with age? That's a very good question. Asthma does get better with age. Children's airways grow between 8 to 12 years of age, and a lot of kids will get relief. The problem is that we are not accurately able to predict which children will become better. Mm. There is some suggestion, there is some association of people who have allergic asthma, mm -hmm. that is asthma that is precipitated by allergies, and hence, you know, they have some markers of allergy, like IgE is one of the markers of allergy. Mm -hmm. Eosinophils is a type of cell which goes along with allergic asthma. So these kids who have allergic asthma, who have a family history of asthma, who have these markers of allergic inflammation, mm -hmm. are the ones that may actually continue to have some symptoms. But again, we don't have any very good model which we can take and say, oh, this child. But a lot of children, as their airways grow, do get... What about better. asthma in adult population? So, asthma in adult population... I know you are expert on the, the, the children, but... Yes, but the basic principles are very similar hmm. between pediatric and adult asthma. So, asthma does continue in some of these patients into adulthood. 
some of these patients who get better from their um, you know, frequent symptoms of asthma as they advance into adulthood will manifest asthma as exercise-induced asthma. Mm. So they may, instead of doing maintenance medications daily, what they were doing as children, they may need um, just sort of rescue inhalations when they are doing um, exercise. Mm. Whereas in some people who have, you know, asthma that's more severe, their lung functions actually decline as they get older. Mm. So that is a big problem in the adult population. And asthma actually, I think people don't realize it, but asthma can be a very serious disease in the sense like about 5,000 people with asthma die every year. In the U.S.? In the U.S., in the yes. US. And I don't think people actually realize, realize. that. And the death rate is a little bit more in the adult population, mm -hmm. perhaps because these severe asthmatics over time mm -hmm. are losing more and more lung function mm -hmm. and getting sicker, you know, so they are at a risk, basically, of bad outcomes. So, uh, of course, you know, the breathing is very essential for living, right? We cannot live mm -hmm. without, even a few minutes without breathing. Uh, is, apart from meditation, is something else which people can do for, for having a healthy lungs and breathing? Yes, certainly. So if you look at like the causes of asthma, mm -hmm. you know, like I mentioned, it's allergens. Mm -hmm. It's a very important cause. Mm -hmm. So there are many strategies by which you can identify allergens. Mm -hmm. You can be tested for what you are allergic to. Mm -hmm. And then each of these may have a avoidance policy mm -hmm. that you can follow and keep away from these. There's also some of these allergens, there's immunotherapy available mm -hmm. so that you can be desensitized. Um, then there's a whole group of certain infections, like viral infections, mm -hmm. certain bacteria, like mycoplasma, which is like a walking pneumonia, mm -hmm. and that can actually um, predispose you to asthma. So many of these viruses, of course, we don't really have very effective treatments, but something like mycoplasma can be treated. Then there's a whole category where, you know, you can get worse with like smoking. Mm -hmm. So we strongly advise nobody should be smoking. Parents should not be smoking. Mm -hmm. You know, many times parents say they smoke outside mm -hmm. and they feel that's okay. But I think the smoke actually comes on their clothes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we absolutely discourage people mm -hmm. to smoke. You know, mm -hmm. these are some of the ways that you can avoid asthma. A lot of people will ask you, should they avoid exercise because, you know, they're getting symptoms while they are exercising. But that's not what we recommend. We recommend that they get, you know, managed and treated mm -hmm. and then continue the exercise because... What about um, uh, the environment or mold in the home? Or, you know, I hear that during Christmas time, people set up the Christmas trees and you know, there's a lot of mold on the Christmas tree mm -hmm. and that causes that difference. Is, is a fact or fiction? No, that is absolutely a fact. Mm -hmm. Mold is one of the allergens mm -hmm. which is which triggers asthma. Mm -hmm. And anytime people have dampness in their house, if there's water leakage, mm -hmm. mold collects behind their walls that they can't see it under their uh, flooring or obviously where you can see it. Mm -hmm. And mold definitely is a big trigger. Mm -hmm. And so I think that should you know, you should make all efforts mm -hmm. to avoid dampness mm -hmm. in the house. Uh, is there any really very long, long-term complications from asthma? So there is some, like I said, of course, as I said, some of the severe asthmatics lose more and more lung function sure. as they get older, so that is a long-term complication. We always talk of something called remodeling, mm -hmm. which is basically because of the inflammation around your airways, mm -hmm. you start getting scar tissue mm -hmm. in some of these asthmatics. Mm -hmm. And also the muscle that's around your airways, mm -hmm. which keeps your airways open, mm -hmm. and when the muscle gets irritated, like in asthma, from all these triggers, it contracts and makes your airways smaller. Over time, some of the asthmatics enlarge this muscle. Mm -hmm. And so your airways kind of become smaller. Mm -hmm. And so that is definitely a long-term complication. Do you foresee a magic pill in the future? Like we just eat, take one and then you are done with it? No. Not really, because I think it's a very complicated multifactorial disease. Mm -hmm. 
affects you know many different inflammatory pathways mm. so that mm. is going to be tough mm. i think what we are doing right now for mm. asthma is very effective in controlling their symptoms allowing them to breathe and what we do is uh, because of all these inflammatory pathways mm. we target them with something called inhaled corticosteroids mm. so basically we have an inhaler mm. that has medica- the corticosteroids mm. in it and corticosteroids are potent anti-inflammatory medications so i think inhaler is a quite common solution for the breathing problems right yes uh, what percentage of, uh, of people who have this problem use that inhalers so the way we decide who n- there are different kinds of inhalers mm-hmm. and so the way we decide is we first try to sort out categories of mm-hmm. where you are in mm-hmm. your asthma mm-hmm. so you could have intermittent asthma mm-hmm. or you could have persistent asthma as mm-hmm. the name suggests intermittent comes sometimes in the year and you know it doesn't really affect your lung functions mm-hmm. and those are called mild intermittent cases mm-hmm. here when they get symptoms we just have them do a rescue inhaler which is called albuterol mm-hmm. which is you know a uh, inhaler that just relieves the muscles spasm it hel- helps to relax the muscles and your airways you know the air can pass through easily now mm-hmm. and so that's all they need the mild intermittent ones you know just when they have the symptoms they just take this inhaler we tell them how often and then they are relieved but then you start moving into the category which is persistent mm-hmm. and we divide that into mild moderate mm-hmm. and per- uh, and severe mm-hmm. so the mild persistent um asthmatics we use um inhaled corticosteroid as mm. i mentioned mm. and because it's an anti-inflammatory drug it keeps the inflammation down in your lung and thus preventing your airways from becoming reactive and becoming narrow so you you were born in india grew up in india you went to medical school in india right and uh, how common how prevalent this asthma is in in india in in as a country so according to you know who figures which has sort of looked into different studies that have been you know reported in india it's about 10 to 15% percent, mm-hmm. um that and that compares with the us what percent is here us is about 8% percent right 8%. now so but there are certain parts in india where it's lower than 10% percent, so would be comparable but in general it seems to be a little bit higher um which is a little bit surprising because um there was a whole thought that in um developing countries because you have a lot more infections mm-hmm. um from bacteria viruses parasites it sort of diverts your immune system to fight those mm-hmm. but where you have very clean environments like the US or some of the other countries the same pathways because they're not attacking the bacteria mm-hmm. and the viruses start actually attacking all the allergens mm-hmm. which they are exposed to mm. and you get huge amounts of like asthma it's called the hygiene hypothesis so but in india i think there's so many other variables mm-hmm. i mean you might have these infections but you might also have a lot of pollution mm-hmm. a lot of smoking around you and then you know in some rural and urban slums there's a lot of um, smoke from chulas you know where they mm. burn coal and mm-hmm. charcoal and all of these factors actually are irritants and you know they can precipitate mm. asthma what about uh, three ways to avoid asthma and allergy attack so i would say like i mentioned before allergen avoidance mm-hmm. you know so you should get tested for whatever allergies are causing you these problems mm-hmm. and then for each of these you know there are sort of strategies to take care of these and then for allergies a lot of the symptoms can be like you know rhinitis which mm-hmm. is like runny nose sneezing mm-hmm. um nasal congestion um so for that you know we have either you have um uh, medicines which you know are anti allergic you know, simple thing like claritin mm-hmm. um or you have nasal sprays mm-hmm. which are again steroid in the form of a nasal spray mm-hmm. and keep in mind i think all the inhalers and nasal sprays the big advantage for that is that the dose of the steroids is very 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 small mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. because it's targeted. Mm-hmm. It's either targeted to your nose or targeted to your airways mm-hmm. or your lungs. So the dose is actually very, very small. So I think those are, you know, and then for allergies, of course, certain allergens, you even have like immunotherapy, mm-hmm. you know, which is like an ongoing topic of, uh, you know, mm-hmm. research. Uh, anything else? Uh, last word on this topic? I would just say that I think people don't think of asthma as a very serious disease. It actually is a very serious disease. It's a very the most common chronic disease that causes a lot of lost school days, a lot of work days for parents, a lot of ED visits, a lot of admissions. And so I think one has to really take that into account. And also, I think people don't realize that it can actually kill sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's extremely important to be diagnosed Mm -hmm. and also take your therapies very, very regularly. Mm -hmm. Because if you are going to be Mm non-compliant or if you're not going to use it in the right way that it's prescribed, Mm -hmm. then I think you're setting yourself up for a lot of morbidity mm-hmm. and, you know, more mortality as mm-hmm. well. One, one last question, you, since you mentioned the Claritin, I see a lot of people, you know, take Claritin. Is there any side effect from Claritin? Has any studies been done? On yes, I mean, you know, as you know, all medicines have some. obviously have yeah. their own side effects and you always, you know, weigh the cost-benefit mm-hmm. uh, ratio. Is there any particular scenario where Claritin should be avoided or...? Um, you know, obviously, if you're allergic to any medication, mm-hmm. that's one reason that you would definitely avoid it. Um, but off the top of my head, I can't think of any, like, serious condition where, okay. you know, um, we would recommend not to. And, of course, in very young children, we do not, below two years of age, right, sure. we prefer okay. not to use well, these uh, medications. Mira, thank you very much for coming to our studio. Thank you for and, inviting uh, me. And we are looking forward to hearing your speech and your presentation at the Health Expo. I am very much looking forward to that as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.